We are going to be covering breakthroughs in additive manufacturing with direct digital production today. My name is Dennis Swain. I'm your host for today's webinar. And I do want to let you know that we've set aside some time at the end of the webinar to answer as many questions as we can get today, get to live. Um, but we will make sure that all of your questions that you submit will be followed up on by one of our specialists after the webinar if, if we can't get to it today. Um, you can ask questions using the Q&A feature on your screen. Please use that rather than the chat feature. Uh, Q&A will ensure that we, we receive all your questions correctly so that we can follow up with you. So let's go ahead and get started. With our agenda uh, at a high level, we're covering high-speed direct plastic part production, high-density vertical stacking, and utilizing figure four as an alternative to cast urethane production. I'd like to also welcome our expert guest speakers today, Patrick Dunn, who is uh, 3D Systems Vice President, Advanced Applications in Engineer. He has more than 21 years of experience with 3D printing, additive manufacturing, um, and in addition to with advanced applications development and engineering. Our second speaker today is Tracy Beard. He is our Director of Operations for 3D Systems On-Demand on Parts Manufacturing. He has more than 35 years experience in prototyping, uh, nearly 20 years experience in, in 3D printing and additive, as well as CNC programming, quality control, and cast urethane, which is one, one of the items he'll be focusing on. So, without further ado, I'll go ahead and welcome Patrick Dunn to get us started for our webinar today. Thank, thanks, Dennis. Can you hear me clearly? I can. You sound great. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Patrick, and uh, I, I work in a, an advanced application development lab in San Francisco, in California, and uh, we have had the opportunity to um, work with the figure four technology, which is the uh, advanced high speed uh, DLP membrane platform um, with some novel materials. And uh, what I'm going to cover today is basically uh, what I'm going to do is describe a step by step walkthrough of the experience that we had when we uh, when we challenged um, our technical team to address a, high, a relatively high volume manufacturing request with a request for a thousand plastic components and what we'll do is we'll just walk through all the uh, all the details of uh, you know to um, just to communicate all the experiences we, that we had uh, with respect to addressing that request okay so if we go to the next slide please uh, so just to, just to look back in the past a little bit first um, the first thing to note is that 3D printing is on a is on a faster rate of uh, improvement relative to traditional technology. So 3D printing is getting faster and faster um, at a at a faster rate essentially than what what than you know than what we're seeing with injection molding. We are seeing some improvement in the speed of injection molding, driven by things like uh, like conformal cooling. But in general, um, we're starting to see more and more applications where uh, specific parts. Um, it is. It does make both economical and and uh, productivity sense to consider utilizing additive. You go to the next slide. <clears throat> the same curves do still apply. So I want to make sure that the expectations are set. Is we don't see uh, additive manufacturing at least at this point with the given technologies um, completely replacing injection molding. I think that's somewhat of a somewhat of an exaggeration. In reality, I see it. Um, you know, taking its place in the toolbox alongside injection molding, uh, you know, augmenting injection molding as another tool that um, specifically is um, applicable for um, opportunities where there's, you know, small plastic parts, uh, low volume, um, and or higher value, i.e. adding, you know, design complexity or textures. But in general, it's its primary application is for is for what we call small to mid production runs. And if you go to the next slide, um, what we'll also cover uh, later in the presentation 
um, sorry, if you go back up one, what we'll also cover later in the presentation uh, with Tracy Beard, my colleague in Lawrenceburg, he'll also look at the role that or, uh, that um, it can play with respect to um, uh, replacing um, you know, room temperature vulcanization or polyurethane RTV casting, essentially, um, which can bridge a little bit more into the mid to higher volumes. Okay, go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> so again, his, looking back historically at examples of, of relatively higher volume production workflows, here's an example from 2010, utilizing selective laser sintering. And again, what drove the capacity here was the massive efficiencies of scale with batching. You take a small plastic part and you array it, you know, 20 by 10 by 5, you get a thousand components in five hours in nylon, comes in at around about 18 seconds per unit. And that 18 seconds is something that began to catch the attention of the, of the traditional manufacturing industry. Go to the next slide. Um, again, another example of bridge manufacturing. This is with an automotive company. They needed 1,200 plastic parts at the last minute, right before the launch of their products, they discovered a, a design flaw that required um, an additional iteration. Um, instead of delaying the launch of their vehicle, uh, while they fixed the tooling or redid the tooling, they were able to bridge the gap by utilizing additive manufacturing, essentially, to temporarily support the production of the plastic parts. And then, of course, as soon as the tooling was was fixed, they were able to substitute in the traditionally manufactured parts. But in this case, that allowed them to get to market on time and not lose money from being late. Okay, next one. <clears throat> Same with stereolithography. All these technologies exhibit massive levels of efficiency when you're batching. In this case, uh, stereolithography LED lampshade. Uh, again, 3D nested, 8 by 8 by 10. In this case, there was some overlap nesting, so there were some efficiencies, not just from uh, the efficiencies of scale, but also the efficiencies of overlap, where essentially, you know, two parts stacked on top of each other with 50% overlap means that for a period of time, you're actually building both parts at the same time, which means you can get a, a, another step change, essentially, in efficiency. In this case, 640 units in a, in a, in a, a photopolymer epoxy coming in at around about 68 seconds per unit build time. Next, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, in the Berkeley lab, uh, the tool that we utilized uh, for this uh, manufacturing study was the figure four modular uh, high-speed VLP membrane system. Uh, and if you go to the next slide. And the plastic that we used was, the, it's a brand new material. It's just been launched. I think this is uh, from, from, our, from our perspective, the technical, team, uh, technical team's perspective we consider this material to be what I would what we would class as the first production grade, real production grade plastic um, for the Figure Four line of products. And what makes it production grade is two is three things. One is it's got really good properties, really strong, really high uh, yield, uh, as well as a high elongation, which means it's got a broad, you know, functional range essentially. Um, the second thing is that when it does break. When the material does break, it doesn't break unexpectedly or suddenly, like you see with brittle, you know, traditional SLA materials or even some of the older figure four materials. It, 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 it has a high yield, so it's signaling back to you that it's still functioning, it's not distorting essentially. And then it has a gap between yield and elongation, which, you know, gives a little bit of buffer so that it, it, it basically fractures almost identical to what you see with a thermoplastic. So it's the first photopolymer, direct photopolymer, that, it's, that is exhibiting a thermoplastic mode of behavior. And you can see that deformation site there where it's fractured, it's, uh, it's yielded, and uh, it's undergone um, uh, plastic deformation at the, at the break site. And then the third thing is that it's got really good life cycle stability. So. It's all very well having good properties, you know, a week or a month after you build a part. But if you want to address the production application, you need a plastic that has good properties six months, a year, two years, three years, five years out, essentially. Otherwise, it's really just a prototyping plastic. And all of these materials now 
that we've just launched uh, that we're classing as production grade, that's one of the key requirements in order to to allow it to be um, allow it to be to be used for production applications. Um, to go to the next slide. Uh, here's a little, just a little gl gl glance at uh, some of the, we do massive amount of environmental testing uh, now on our plastics. Um, production black pen, you can see there starts off uh, with a relatively good elongation to break. And then it's relatively static. Uh, you see the same with Pro Black 10. If anything, it, it, it actually improves a little bit. This tensile strength actually gets a little bit better. If you look at the leading competitor uh, in this space, um, and we ran their materials through the exact same accelerated environmental testing, you know, cycles of UV and water and heat and, and cold and desiccation, basically to replicate both indoor and outdoor long-term stability. And what we discovered um, was, was actually quite surprising is that the best uh, competitor we have out there, their best material that they class as their best production grade material. Yeah, it starts off really amazing. You know, it's actually better than where we start off, but it, it's unstable. It has, it, has it's base, it falls off a cliff essentially. And when we look at uh, extrapolating out to the five year timeline, which is replicated by 400 hours in, in, the, in, the, in the case of um, in the case of um, of elongation to break, you can see that it falls to uh, it actually falls close to zero after around about uh, six years. Um, and on the case of elongation to break, we found that after just um, six to seven months, their leading production grade material, when exposed to outdoor environmental conditions. It, it's like the properties just get washed away. So in that context, we think that the, um, we have something very, very competitive here, uh, driven by, uh, driven, you know, by a bunch of things, including the fact that we have really good life cycle stability that enables production workflows. And and as Tracy will cover in the second half of this presentation, um, we're uh, very similar properties right now to off-the-shelf commodity grade polyurethane that you can that are used extensively for low volume production workflows. So we've got a good validation there. Okay, if you go to the next slide. Uh, and of course, the other interesting thing about the figure four uh, is the ultra high fidelity, you know, very, very thin layers, relative to stereolithography, there's an order of magnitude thinner, 10, 10 microns, 20, 30 micron thin layers combined with microscopic Blended pixels, like 65 micron pixels that are blended, so they're not, it's not just black or white. We have all kinds of grayscales and advanced imaging techniques going on. And what they enable is smooth, both smooth sidewalls on demand, uh, production grade sidewalls, as well as uh, production grade digital textures. And that's critical for production because if you have to sand the part, if, you, if it takes one minute to sand one part and you have 5,000 parts, impossible to address in a production application. You can't scale if you have to apply any labor. So all the parts you're going to see have had zero sanding or zero physical hand finishing or labor. They are, they are, they are dipped in solvents, washed, dried, and cured. That's it. They're raw surface quality. And that's another really important kind of elephant in the room that a lot of additive, additive manufacturing companies don't necessarily consider. And, a lot of their marketing samples will, you, you just don't know what's been done. I mean, they've been sanded and finished and filed and bead blasted and all that kind of stuff. What you're gonna see here is the raw surface quality that you get out of the product uh, when, you, when you run it, okay? So if you go to the next slide. <clears throat> okay, so let's look at high density vertical stacking. So like in leaning on some of the learnings from the past with, 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 the, with efficiencies of scale. Um, and let's, uh, let's, go to the next, uh, let's go to the next slide, get started. Okay, so here's the parts that we, uh, we utilized. We actually originally just started with the, the big part, part B, and we quickly realized that when we nest it in 3D, we have empty spaces um, that are wasted essentially. So we decided to grab a second part, a smaller part, and then kind of uh, nest it in between the bigger parts in order to uh, get uh, even more efficiency. So if you go to the next slide. Um, and here you see a graphic uh, utilizing 3D sprint we were able to 3D nest the parts and then construct support structures. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, play a video here. So 
this is show a video showing the build process. Um, and in this case, we were, I think we were pulling, I think it was 120 plastic components um, from the 2D mem from the 2D plane in the tough production grade plastic in around about five hours, five hours and 15 minutes. I think it was <laughs> Yeah. Okay. And so yeah, two, so that that equates to 120 parts, so 60 the big parts, 60 the small parts. Uh, uh, equates to normalized it equates to 2.5 minutes per unit. And that's from one engine. Total height is 350 millimeters. That comes in at around about 64 millimeters per hour. And that's irrespective of of part density. So if you if you had one part or 10 parts per cross section, it's still 60 63 millimeters per hour, 64 millimeters per hour because we're utilizing DLP membranes. There's no correlation between cross-sectional density or intensity or perimeter length or area and, uh, and build time essentially, which is why it makes sense to maximize the amount of parts you can fit on any given, any given batch. Okay, if you go to the next slide. And uh, here's kind of a close up just to show you the raw surface quality. So again, no sanding, no finishing, no bead blasting, no filing. You know, a lot of the samples you get from Marketing sales kits and stuff like that that companies send out are often reflective of, you know, some person at a bench spending lots of time finishing it. And you know what? If you buy a machine, that person doesn't come in the box, right? So I consider it a little bit deceptive. What we're showing here is the raw surface quality of the parts. And the cool thing about the figure four is because it's such high fidelity is that we believe that the raw surface quality is actually good enough for for most kind of functional production application and production parts, essentially. You go to the next slide. Um, so here's kind of a, a graphic showing the bimodal nesting. So this is the finished batch washed. Um, and you can see uh, the small part A, small part B, right, nested. So if you go to the next slide. Um, now what's interesting, uh, here's another, another close up just to give you a visual. If you go to the next slide, please. Yeah, I'm going to sit on this slide for a second here. Again, you see the, the raw surface quality, but what's also really in, intriguing here is the absolute um, pinpoint support. So there's almost no support structures, right? And again, if you want to scale to higher volumes, again, another elephant in the room in the 3D printing industry is support structure removal. And the way to solve support structure removal is, is, is number one, you have to start with a process that doesn't really require any support structures. And the cool thing about the membrane on the figure four platform is that it's got almost no adhesion. It's, it's, an, uh, it's an oxygen permeable uh, zero adhesion membrane. There's a liquid interface essentially between the cross section and the membrane, which means there's very, very little peeling force or adhesion. And what that means is, is, is several things. One is you can go incredibly fast. Two, you have very little distortion, so you got really high precision, which is why it's um, you know, a very successful pro product in the dental industry, which is extremely high precision. Uh, and number three, which is really interesting, is, is you, you, you need very few support structures. And in this case, we were able to whittle down the number of supports to basically five per part. There's three pinpoint initiation supports just for kind of a stability, and then there's one pinpoint support on the y-axis and then one on the x-axis just to stop any kind of lateral wobbling as we're building. But the net result is that we have almost no supports to remove, which is interesting. And I'll show you some of the implications of that further downstream when we look at the uh, support removal process. Okay, so if you go to the next slide. Um, so again, this is something that often you know, sales and marketing don't necessarily cover, but it's a reality. You have to clean the parts. The cool thing about the batch vertical nesting process is if it takes 15 minutes to clean one part and you have turned a batch of 120 parts essentially into one part, then it's 15 minutes for 120 components. So the efficiencies of scale go beyond just um, the building process itself, they're also very applicable um, to the downstream post process. And in this case, 
it was basically 20 <clears throat> dunks in clean IPA, followed by an airline, followed by 20 dunks again in, in clean IPA, second IPA, clean IPA, and we distill our IPA, so we've got almost no waste stream, uh, followed by airline, followed by uh, putting in the PCA. And the PCA is around about 90 minutes of cure time, but the actual labor itself, which is all we're doing here is measuring physical labor, um, the, the, the two minutes was the time it took to walk into the lab, open the PCA, put the parts in the PCA, close it again, and walk back to the desk, essentially. So what you're looking at here from a physical labor burden perspective is around about 15 minutes of total time applied to a batch of 120 components. And, and this is just the first iteration. I mean, we've all kinds of ideas here. If you go to the next slide about how we can look at uh, automating, um, you know, different, different stages in the washing process. So here's the support removal um, concept that we came up with. And this is something that for you to try yourself. Uh, so it doesn't really work with any other technology other than figure four because of the minimal, number one, the minimal support, number two, the minimal contact points, pinpoint contact supports essentially. But we took the entire batch, put it in a plastic bag, put it in a cardboard box, and then we threw it into our cement mixer. We have an SLS lab as well. We threw it into the SLS powder mixing uh, cement mixer. We switched it on and every five minutes we took it out and we did a little count and what we found is that after 20 minutes, a um, 100% of the support structures were gone. And it hit us that this is actually a little bit more like sprue, sprue removal or even flash removal with vibratory tumbling and walnut shells and stuff like that. And we're gonna explore this a little bit further, but at the first attempt, we were able to remove 100% of the support structures using you know, a crude form of automation. But at the end of the day, nobody had to sit down and manually remove the support structures. And that was, it was kind of interesting to see that. And you can see the graphic at the top showing, you know, the, the ratio of parts to supports and the debris on the side there with the little, little, little initiation frame. Okay, if you go to the next slide. Um, and of course, just to give you kind of insight into some of the thinking here, you know, e even though it's 15 minutes of labor, there was a phase where a person had to dunk essentially the parts up and down in the container. We're looking at uh, you know bubble agitation. We're looking at uh, chem stir stir agitation. We're also looking at uh, automating it with robotics. Um, you know, five-axis robots can essentially do everything that a person would need to do in order to clean the parts. If you go to the next slide, <clears throat> and then just a quick glance at the accuracy. Okay, it's all very well having a nice you know shiny plastic part um, with no support structures, but how accurate is it? And again, this is the first. Um, the first shot, basically, with these parts, we think we can tune the machine a little bit better. It wasn't fully calibrated, but it came in at around about 85% uh, coming in within 125 microns. And then the critical surfaces, you know, the hose fittings and stuff, diameters were coming in at around about 20 microns. Um, on average, most of the surfaces were coming in at around about plus or minus 35 microns. And, that's more than, you know, it's not as good as injection molding, but it's more than good enough for a lot of applications um, is what we found. Okay, if you go to the next um, slide, and, and by the way, just to, sorry, if you just go back up there, what we use for, for this is we use Geomagic, um, Geomagic Control X, right? It's where we scan that physical piece of plastic and then we register it back onto the SPL file and then we generate a heat map which shows, um, Delta, which shows deviation from the uh, from nominal, so you can get a you can get a visual on the accuracy of the part, uh, global global accuracy of the components. It's a very useful tool for um, for problem solving as well as uh, quickly kind of cutting to uh, uh, you know tool capability with respect to accuracy on 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 plastic part production. If you go to the next slide, um, yeah. So this is this is kind of an interesting yeah, metric, which is. Uh, the total stacked batch was 643 megabytes. And when combined with 6.8 kgs of fluid, so we take you know, 643 megabytes of data and blend it with 6.8 kgs of fluid or you know, raw material, um, what we got was 6.5 kg of physical plastic product out in total. And what that means is that we, um, oh, lost my WebEx. Can you still see your WebEx? Yep, we can still hear you. Okay, good. I'm just going to, uh, 
I've lost my presentation here for some reason, but I'm going to open up my own version here. If you could just bear with me one second. Just do that. Okay, and I think I can walk through this because I've got my own slides here. Yeah, so the, so the, the, net, uh, the net realization here is just the, the material efficiency. If you look, there's a lot of additive manufacturing processes out there, inkjet and SLS, and we have a whole you know, broad portfolio of technologies. But you know, there's, 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 it's not just the parts out that drive the material consumption. It's also the material efficiency of the process, right? And if you look at some of the uh, powder bed fusion or, or sintering technologies, then the ratio um, of parts to waste can be quite high. It can be you know between 20 and 40 percent in some instances. In this case, we're getting close to you know 95 percent plus efficiency essentially with just 300 grams of material lost to the sprues, um, which is which is what we're calling support structures, by the way, sprues, right? I mean, there's another artifact from, from manufacturing, uh, as well as the residue on the parts, as well as the residue on the platform. It comes in at a, a relatively relatively small ratio. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, yeah, so the fully burdened cost of the small part is 62 cents, and the fully burdened cost of the large part is $2. And that includes the material, the machine, as well as the isopropyl alcohol, the distillation unit, the gloves, the paper napkins, the labor, the electricity, everything. So we did a fully burdened analysis here, and you can see, you know, the large part if you needed 1,000 of them, you can have 1,000 of them for $2,000, and you can have it within 48 hours, essentially, on a single engine, right? So compared to injection molding, um, if somebody came to you on a Monday and said, I need you know, 1,000 of those, I can guarantee you, number one, it's going to cost more if you add in the, you know, the cost of the tooling divided by the number of units, it's going to cost more than $2 per part, as it just is a function of the tooling. And it's certainly going to take more than 48 hours for you to get the job complete. And that's kind of the whole point of this class of technologies that it enables direct digital production of plastic parts on demand. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, this is what it looked like after um, 48 hours. Um, and then, sorry, this is what it looked like after 24 hours. And if you go to the next slide, this is what it looked like after 48 hours. So. The goal was a thousand parts, and we actually got up to one thousand two hundred plastic components, and it's it's kind of cool. I mean, this is not prototyping; this is production, and we had buckets and buckets of parts. And you know, in the lab, I could hear people pouring buckets, and it's the sound of plastic parts pouring is something that you don't typically hear. It's like you know, buckets of gravel pouring It's not something you typically hear in a prototyping lab. It's something that you hear in manufacturing, in a factory floor, right, where there's hoppers of plastic parts being produced, and it's kind of cool to see that. Um, Go to the next slide uh, to just give a little indication of where this tool is applicable. Again, like I said at the beginning, I don't see this class of technology uh, at this stage, at least. I mean, eventually, you know, if you kind of have, a, if there's a Moore's law involved here, then yeah, eventually everything could be could potentially produced um, at high speed directly on demand. But for now, it's real application is low rate initial production, low volume production, maybe some mid volume, depend, depending on the size of the part, right? Um, there's always little details like that. Um, and then, you know, injection molding will continue to support higher volume um, or longer term volume production just because of the really good economics with injection molding for higher volume. Uh, but I also see figure four being very applicable at the end of life cycle, right? So if you have a product that is in the market for 10 years, like electronic connectors and, and there's some kind of a product warranty uh, where you need to continue to supply them, but the demand is maybe only for you know 10 to 20 connectors a year. It just doesn't make sense to for injection molding tool available. Number one, it doesn't make sense to necessarily build you know 100 parts and then store them in a warehouse and have to expense the tracking and storing and logistics. It, it, it probably makes sense just to build them on demand when you need them. Um, so you know essentially the ultimate in lean manufacturing, right? If the object doesn't exist. You request it, you make it, you ship it, you install it, essentially. So I think that's a, that's a valid application for this tool. And it may very well be, if you look at that green line, uh, some applications where the volumes are so low and the parts so small that, hey, you know what? You're not even going to think about injection molding. You just need a 1,000 of these plastic parts. Let's make them. And an example of that, a real-world example, is if you look at our 
uh, on the next slide, if you look at our figure four platform itself, you know, like we, 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 we don't need many plastic parts, right? I mean, we make, you know, 400, maybe a thousand of these in, you know, the next year, you know, the question is, um, does it make sense to create an injection molding tool for 400 plastic parts? No, it probably doesn't. Just print them, right? And of course, you know, you're able to consolidate several individual plastic components that tra traditionally would require assembly into a single part. So if you go to the next slide, if you, you know, if you have a modular figure four, one of the more recent models, what you'll see is a little hose clamp component uh, which doses the machine with resin between bills and also on tall bills. Uh, automatically, um, it, you know, it costs $10 to produce on demand, and we were able to produce about 12 of them in eight hours, uh, coming in with a build time of 40 minutes, and that's fine. You know, if you just need 200 a year, it's the, the, the headache of thinking about how to make this using injection molding exceeds the amount of time it takes just to fully produce the parts using a DLP printer, essentially using the figure four printer. Um, okay. Um, Dennis, that concludes my presentation. Um, my email address is here. If anybody has any follow-on questions, um, please feel free to email me or reach out to me on LinkedIn if you want to connect. Um, I'm going to pass the presentation over to Tracy Beard, who runs our on-demand manufacturing facility in Lawrenceburg and has um, has a uh, factory floor full of the full of the Figure Four platforms right now and using them for what we just talked about, direct plastic part production. Um, and it's also found um, an interesting uh, application um, that's justifiable economically as, a, as, a, as an alternative to uh, polyurethane or TV casting. So Tracy, over to you. All right, well, thank, thanks, Patrick. Uh, Dennis, I've also lost that. Um that WebEx connection, so I'll try to follow along just like Patrick did. So, um, so one of the things uh, at the parts manufacturing level we're constantly looking for is methods of producing, uh, you know, cast urethane, low volume uh, production parts faster and cheaper. So, uh, as Patrick mentioned, we've installed Figure Fours, and they've been able to accomplish just that. So. Uh, today, what I would like to do is present uh, what we found to be some of the key advantages of using Figure 4 as an alternative to cash urethane for these low volume production orders. Uh, we're going to do that by reviewing three projects we produced in our shop uh, using both methods. So, uh, and each of those represent a different material selection. So, next slide, please. Uh, so the three geometries we'll compare today are what we call a nozzle, a window clip, and a car vent. Uh, next, please. So the first part that we'll be comparing is the nozzle. So what I'd like to do is just maybe take a minute to cover some of the steps required uh, to produce that part uh, in an ABS-like cast urethane. Uh, so really there are four required steps. Um, first, we create a master pattern by adding shrink to a 3D file. Uh, then we print a stereolithography model and then manually finish and apply any required textures. Um, after that, we go to the tooling process where we have to machine uh, any types of slides or pins that are required. Uh, we establish a parting and then we create a RTV silicon tooling. Uh, after that's complete, we actually mix and then pour two-part urethanes into the silicon tool uh, using a combination of vacuum and, and pressure casting methods. So, uh, and then finally, once that material sets up, uh, we have to remove the parts from the silicon tooling and manually finish them to remove gates and vents. So it's a, it's a very manual process. So again, we're looking at ways of uh, reducing some of that manual labor. So. Uh, one thing to also notice is the casting and finishing steps are repeated for each part order. So if it's a 25 piece order, we have to repeat that process 25 times. So uh, the next, um, the entire process that we're talking about here took us about six days to produce the first part from the time we received the order until we had the part ready to ship and about 14 days in our shop to produce a 25 piece order. Uh, and the total labor hours spent producing those 25 parts was about 21 hours and 25 minutes. So um, quite, a bit of, quite a bit of labor involved. 
Um, I'd also like to note on, on this process, one thing we're, we're constantly looking to improve is silicon tooling is only good for about 25 pieces. So every 25 piece order, uh, a new tool is required. So uh, next, please. So here uh, shows what we um, we done with figure four. Uh, it's the same nozzle part that was printed on one of our modular figure four modular printers in a tough black 20 material that took only eight and a half hours to actually set up, print, and finish 12 parts using the vertical stacking that, that uh, Patrick had discussed earlier. So the build time actually, the build setup actually only took about 15 minutes, which uh, for us was less than the time we spent just adding strength to the 3D file we used to produce our cashier thing. So the setup is really fast. Uh, the print time for those 12 parts was seven hours and 35 minutes. And the finish time for those 12 parts was about 40 minutes. So basically it allowed us to print and finish 12 parts per shift. So next slide, please. So here's a graph uh, that shows the timeline for producing uh, parts from each method. So the first cast urethane part, as you can see on the blue line, uh, was ready to ship on day six. And then the 25 piece order was complete on day 14. Uh, figure four, on the other hand, uh, allowed us, would allow us to ship 12 parts on day one and a total of 168 parts in that same 14-day time frame. So, uh, next, please. Uh, so the second part uh, we're wanting to review is just uh, called a window clip, uh, and it was produced in a polypropylene light material. Same four steps uh, we discussed earlier on the nozzle and SLA master pattern. RTB tool, casting, and finishing. So on this particular part, the total number of work days, again, to produce that first part was about six days, and the total number of days to produce 25 parts was about 13 days. And the total labor hours spent producing 25 parts was about 15 hours, a little over 15 hours. So, so as you can see here, you know, cashier thing is a fairly labor intense process. So uh, next slide, please. So for this uh, figure four print, we again used vertical uh, stacking to print 20 parts per build on, on one of our figure four modular printers using a flex black 20 material, which is a polypropylene light material. The build setup again only took about 15 minutes, uh, really a little bit less than that. Uh, print time for the 20 parts was about 13 hours and nine minutes. And then the finish time for those same 20 parts was about an hour and 15 minutes. So. Uh, the first time, the, the time to ship the first 20 parts was actually next day, and then we were able to ship 20 parts per day after that, and that's just utilizing one shift per day. So next slide, please. So again, uh, this graph shows the timeline of the car vent using both methods. Uh, cast urethane is basically the same uh, first part uh, day six and then 25 parts on this particular part was day 13. Uh, and figure four, on the other hand, uh, we were able to ship 20 parts on day two, but 240 parts uh, in that same 13 day time frame. So a, a big advantage in, in time for figure four. So. Uh, next, please. So the final part that we uh, try, that we produced in house was what we call a two piece car vent. So as you can tell from the pictures, uh, the inner vent has an undercut that really made it impossible for us to cast using our, our cast urethane method, method without uh, some significant design changes, without having to go back and have someone uh, change their design. So. But we were able to cast the outer vent using the same steps described earlier. Um, basically the same thing, total number of work days uh, to produce the first was six and then about 25, about 13 days to produce the entire 25 piece order. Uh, and again, quite a bit of labor is about 14, uh, 14 hours uh, labor to, to produce those 25 pieces. So uh, next please.
So for this uh, build, uh, we again used uh, the vertical stacking, but we were able to produce five sets of parts on our figure four modular printer using the Pro Black 10 material. So this build uh, set up again took about 15 minutes and the print time for five sets was only four hours, 54 minutes. So, uh, and the finish time for these five sets was about an hour and five minutes. So uh, what we wanted to, to note by this, the key point to this is the parts could be printed as design uh, since the figure four printing process was not limited by the undercut. So, um, and those undercuts made it impossible to, uh, for us to cast those. So that was a big advantage for figure four not having to change those designs. So uh, next, please. So what I'd like to do is take a couple of minutes just to recap what we found to be some of those key advantages. Uh, number one was speed, right? The first parts as fast as same day uh, and up to 10 times the number of parts produced in the same time frame as cast urethane out of material that has the same uh, physical properties. So, uh, and there are minimal design limitations. You know, parts can be printed on figure four as design where oftentimes we have to go back and make design changes to, to be able to cast those parts. Uh, the repeatable accuracy and finish, uh, unlike cast urethane as the tool wears, the accuracy and finish decline, but figure four, uh, the first part uh, versus the 200th part we printed had the same accuracy, same finish. So uh, consistent texture and finish between designs. Oftentimes we're uh, doing multiple parts that go together as an, as an assembly. On figure four, all the texture and finish can be applied to the 3D data, which makes it very uniform and repeatable versus cast urethane where we're applying a lot of that uh, finishes by hand, so some of the finishes vary from part to part. So uh, one last thing I didn't add to my slide, but I was thinking as I went through is, uh, you know, one of the other things I'd like to mention is the actual labor spent uh, on each part. So on figure four, uh, the labor spent was only about 10% of the actual labor that we spent on a cast year thing part. So as Patrick mentioned earlier, it's basically print those you know, remove the supports, wash them, and you've got a good, uh, good working part that you can sell to the customers. So, uh, I think that's it for me. Thank you, Tracy. Right, uh, thank great, you. Great overview, and we do have quite a few questions. I know we're right at, right here at the end of the 45 minutes. Uh, for all those that can stay, um, please do. We're going to go a few minutes over just to answer a few of these questions. Um, but also want to remind you, we will make sure that all of your questions are answered by uh, specialists at 3D Systems. So, uh, Patrick, one question that came in during your presentation is what is the minimum wall thickness you can print on this material? Uh, doesn't look maybe in case we had some some issues there w with the webinar. Uh, Tracy, are you on? Yes, I am. So um, uh, you know, Patrick would probably be, uh, can probably give a better answer to that. But I will say that we've been able to produce some living hinges, which typically down in that ten to fifteen thousands range that have uh, performed very well for us. They printed well and also performed well. So got it. And Patrick, you're unmuted. Thanks. Thank you for unmuting me. Appreciate it. <laughs> um, yeah, so, I mean, it's, it's a good question. Um, the, 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 the reality is, is that there's aspect ratios, right? So if you had, a, say, for example, a paper thin, 100 micron sheet um, on a small area, say five by five millimeters, you could express that and it would survive, you know, the washing process. Um, no problem. You could express it like a vertical 100 micron sheet. But if you were to print a bigger sheet, you know, 50 by 50 millimeters that was 100 microns thick, um, it's just too flexible. I mean, a piece of injection molded plastic that's the thickness of a sheet of paper is not going to stand up to the washing process, essentially. So, so it, it, it really depends. Um, what I have seen is um, edges and corners and details that are basically um, better than what you can achieve with even injection molding. I mean, that's, that's the reality of this platform is the detail fidelity is, is right up there. I've seen very, very fine connector parts 
with pinpoint holes, so 100 micron pinpoint holes. Again, aspect ratio is important. If it was six inches long, you're not going to get the resin out of a 100 micron capillary, right? But if it's uh, on an electronic connector and it's two millimeters and it's a 100 micron pinpoint hole, you'll be able to flush the resin out of that feature. So it's very ge geometry dependent. You really just got to, um, you know, put it on there, take 10 minutes to build a part that's a, you know, a few millimeters high. You'll very, very quickly determine whether or not you're capable of building that feature. Okay. That's great. Uh, we have another question about nesting. Is the nesting done manually or do you have a 3D nesting software? Um, the, the demonstrations that we're showing here is, is we're doing, it's not click a button and auto 3D nest. That is something that we are looking at implementing. But in general, it's a combination of, at this point, it's a combination of doing the 3D array in CAD um, and then generating the 3D sprint support as if it's just a single SPL file. So you do the array, you save it as a single multi-shell SPL file, and then just treat it as a single part, essentially. And, and um, yeah, there's, there's, and there's definitely a lot of room for optimization there, but it's a, it's a combination at this point. Okay. Great. Well, you just answered the next question was, is, is 3D Sprint a part of Figure 4? So, yes, it is. Yes. Uh, the next question here is uh, comment, great long-term testing of, of your, your materials compared to the printer this you currently have. Looking at UV exposure only, do you have any information on how material work will perform at low and high yeah. temperatures? Um, we, so we, we have, with the, with the accelerated environmental testing, it's, it's water, you know, direct water, it's humidity, it's thermal cycles um, of hot and cold, and it's also um, UV exposure. So the material is actually UV stabilized. Um, and you can imagine a lot of the learning on UV stabilization comes from the dental industry. You know, if you want to make a composite material for a crown or a denture, it's critical that the color stability and the appearance stability is preserved, you know, for up to 10 years, essentially. And that's something that we've figured out with these, with these uh, recent production grade materials that, yes, they're UV stabilized as well as thermally cycled, uh, thermal cycle stabilized. That's great. And then, now we have a d direct question about our on-demand manufacturing services. Is Figure 4 and the new material, specifically they're asking about Pro Black 10, going to be available using 3D Systems on-demand manufacturing services? So, uh, so yes, we are currently um, installing a, a fleet of about 25 Figure 4 printers that we're going to use to uh, to offer figure four through our on-demand services. So those are not completely installed yet. We've got several units that we've been testing, but uh, once complete, we're thinking around the Q1 of 2020, then we should start being able to offer those services. So. That's great. Um, we are actually right on, we, we ran out of time a few minutes ago, but I did want to get some of your questions in. We're going to do this one last question. Literally, we've got about 60 here, so thank you for everyone. Uh, uh, sending in your questions. The last question here is looking at the charts that you've, you've shown today, are you looking at expanding new materials for other production applications uh, beyond the material shown today? Um, yeah, yeah, I can answer that. I mean, definitely. I mean, that's um, the, the whole point, one of the, one of the primary points of this, of this class of platform relative to stereolithography is that you don't need big bats of material, right? So you can you can um, explore far more reactive chemistries that traditionally you would never consider, you know, reactive chemistry, chemistries that can give you novel properties and novel capabilities that ultimately will, e will lead to novel applications. So yes, the answer is absolutely. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Tracy, uh, for hanging in there with some of the issues there. Uh, luckily, everyone else on the screen did great. Um, we really appreciate your time today. And again, we are going to get all of your questions over to a specialist to answer for you. Please enjoy the rest of your day and, or evening, night, wherever you may be. Thanks again.